Okay, so welcome to a new episode of the Location Independent Startup Show. So in this episode is a little bit different in that I'm interviewing another podcast host, Nick Bradley. So Nick's a good friend of mine and he has had a very successful and quickly growing podcast in the USA and in the UK. I think the UK he started and he's really now growing in the US. So I want to really understand how he grows a very successful business on the back of a podcast and how he's growing his own brand. I think Nick's one of the best guys I know talking about branding and his own brand and personal branding. So I think this will be super interesting. And if you like this episode, uh, please feel free to subscribe, whether that's on YouTube or Spotify or on Apple Podcasts. And if you have time, leave a review. That'd be awesome. So thanks very much. And uh, please enjoy the show. Thank you. Welcome to the Location Independent Startup Show. Here we discuss business, lifestyle design, personal development, and much more with some very special guests and experts who have been there and done that. Learn how to live life on your terms with me as your host, British entrepreneur and investor, John Cavendish. Today, I have Nick Bradley with me, a friend of mine who was my uh, Tony Robbins buddy back in the last year in Tenerife when we were doing health and life. So we have uh, been through some stuff together. <laughs> that was a crazy experience. So and, um, yeah, Nick's an amazing uh, coach, CEO, and I'll let you, and I can't do him justice, so I've passed over to him to introduce himself. Okay, well, it's good to be here, John. Thanks for having me on the show. And yeah, are we going to go into those experiences today or not? <laughs> um, I think some things are better left unsaid. <laughs> Let's just say, let's just say for um, for the listeners, um, it's it's like a health spa thing. So you do lots of health related stuff with diet um, yeah. <clears throat> and trying different things out. So you know, leave and... that to everyone's imagination for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so um, yeah, so I, I I do a few different things. Um, yeah, I, I coach and I mentor um, business leaders, business owners who are trying to scale their business. Um, so that's usually anywhere from it's kind of past the startup phase, and usually when they've got a team. They're trying to um, work out how they can become a better leader, how they can build that team, how they can work with clients and suppliers better. So I do a lot of work around that. Um, I too have a podcast um, called Scale Up Your Business, which is um, uh, pretty prolific in the UK and starting to grow in the US and pretty much does what the (laughs) the name suggests. And uh, prior to that, I've got a background of working with private equity firms, going into um, businesses that haven't been performing very well, and effectively doing turnaround growth and scale up. So I've been doing that for them for years now. I effectively do that by myself um, with a number of different um, businesses that I own. Oh, that's awesome. And actually it was Nick that uh, inspired me to start a podcast six months ago and actually made me start a podcast six months later. Well, obviously, <laughs> like usual, procrastinate. I did procrastinate. the same thing though, John. I did the same thing. I, I went to this course back in the UK, I think it was 20, it must've been 2018. And I sat there for six months thinking about it. So it's quite a common way of, uh, of mm. launching. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Well, now we're starting to move. Um, yeah. Building our processes. And uh, yeah, hopefully we're going to be pumping our episodes soon. So um, you've already given us a bit of a background of your business. So now you're, yeah, you're completely out of corporate. So what does your business do? How do you make money? Yeah, cool. So, I mean, as per the title of this podcast, I can work anywhere which is great. So um, I, I kind of, a lot of my stuff is done virtually and I'll kind of get into the business model of how I make money from that. So mm. if I'm coaching or mentoring someone, as I said, it's usually on two different levels. So I'll either be put into a business by an investor um, and that's where they're not confident they're going to get a return. So they'll put me into either work with the CEO or the founder of that business. So that's one routine and I get paid obviously to do that. Um, or I get brought in um, or approached by the founders themselves and they, have a specific challenge and that's usually about, hey, the business is performing quite well, but we want to now grow it quickly, rapidly, you know, make it more of a machine and then try and sell it to a private equity firm or something like that in the future. So I normally go into those businesses and I'll do more of a consultancy advisory play. And sometimes I get asked to sit on the board, I get gifted some equity as well to kind of be there on the journey. Um, So that's kind of the main piece around that. I also have a consultancy firm called The Fielding Group, which does the implementation of any of the strategic work that I may help with. So if I go into a business and they're not, um, let's say their commercial piece isn't working very well, their marketing isn't optimized, they're not selling as much as they should. We do a fair amount of analysis, um, lots of data, lots of metrics to work out where the problems are. 
and then I have um, specialists who can go in there for a certain amount of time and, and help fix the problem. Um, so I do that. And then the last part of it is um, I also buy and sell my own businesses. And we can get into that a bit today if you want. And that's kind of more about wealth creation, a longer term way of making uh, or generating income. But my whole philosophy is having multiple streams. So at the moment, we have around seven or eight. Um, and one of my mentors has 37. So I've got a, yeah. a long way to go on that. That's really awesome. And that's what actually inspired me about your podcast in the first place when we were talking about it was that you had traction very quickly and it was a great way to generate clients. I mean, maybe you could talk a bit about that because this show is kind of, you know, either at startup level or a bit higher or we're scaling. And I just thought the way you were generating clients, generating traffic from podcasting was super cool and not something I'd heard of many other people doing as rapidly as you were doing. Yeah, I'll, I'll get into that because I've, I've also learned some stuff as well um, in, on that journey. In fact, um, I'll start there because it's quite interesting. I had a guy on my podcast last week called um, John Lee Dumas. And um, if anyone knows of a podcast called Entrepreneurs on Fire, Fire Nation, it's one of the most successful podcasts in the world. What's interesting about John, John Lee, is um, he publishes all the money that he makes from his podcast. Mm. So since um, origination, he's made $17 million gross and 12 million net nice. and has done over 2000 interviews. And so what he, what I asked him the other day, I said, how, did, how have you managed to do this? How have you grown? And he said, well, there's a couple of things. It's about being relentless and consistent with putting out content. And he, you know, when he started, he was doing daily podcasts. Mm. I do weekly, but if I bring it back to kind of what I've done, which mirrors some of that, is first and foremost, um, I've never missed a week in 18 months. And, and every Thursday, an episode goes out, right? So there's a, there's a piece there where people kind of come to expect it. They look forward to it. Um, so that's, that's an important part. You can't, you're going to get successful at podcasting. It can't be just something you just decide to do now and then and throw something out there. It's got to be a consistent habit. Uh, so much so that I'm going to be starting to put out two episodes per week um, as of two weeks time. So one shorter one on a Monday and then my longer ones on a Thursday just to kind of build up more content. But um, if you kind of start with the John Lee Dumas example where you can end up kind of what I did, there's a few things. First and foremost, um, I didn't overthink the name. So scale up your business. You know, it's pretty clear what it is, unless you don't know what scale means. <laughs> which Some people <laughs> don't it kind of means business growth, right? Yeah, so I did that. Um, the other thing I did, which is different is if people listen to the podcast, it doesn't just focus on the usual stuff, right? It's, uh, yeah. I add, I add some color to it and the color comes around mindset. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll talk about that today. So I talk about, you know, marketing, I talk about sales, I talk about operational leverage. I talk about some of the stuff you're great at John, the whole systems and all the process stuff, but lots of business podcasts talk about that. What I talk about more than anything is you've got to get your psychology right. So you've got to be able to have a vision. You've got to be able to create goals that are achievable, but also, um, again, focused on in a very intentional way. So I'll talk about that a bit today as well. Um, and so because of that, there was the mix. So when people kind of went into my podcast, they thought they were getting one thing and then they ended up getting a lot more. And that started to build a lot more trust, authenticity. I tell my story. So that's the first part. Second part, um, which was kind of, I suppose, interesting is I, um, I deliberately went out there and started to, I suppose, populate in various communities, um, kind of what I was doing and everything was about help. So the whole reason for doing it was about adding my perspective, how I could help people grow their businesses. And as I started to seed that out, um, it started to get quite a strong following. But the key answer to your question is the proposition the proposition of my podcast and the person that I was targeting, that kind of mm -hmm. ideal person, you know, that one-to-one -one conversation with that person. I got that bit right from the beginning and then everything else grew from that. Oh, that's awesome. Very good answer as well. You uh, obviously do answer. this a lot. No, it's good. It's good. <laughs> actually. There's, a lot, there's a lot to it. I'd like to unpack a few of the things you said there. Um, sure. One of you talking about monetization and John Lee Dumas. So, you know, he said he's done 17 million in, re in revenue. Like where did, that's you know, right. where he's where coming revenue. from? Is that sponsorships? Is yeah. That, what is it? Yeah. He, you know what? It's worth, if anyone's trying to get into this, if you go to his website, um, I forget the actual URL, but we can put it into the show notes, I'm sure. But um, you, know, you can just Google John Lee Dumas and you'll get everything. You'll get his profile. He actually publishes his monthly accounts. Yep. Bizarre, right? He's even got the March 2020 accounts there. 
And um, he basically has um, advertising. It, it's a little bit too commercial in terms of I don't take any advertising on my podcast. I don't really plan to, but he has advertising. Um, I reckon he also includes what we call trickle down revenue, which is where he's speaking and he's using his personal brand to monetize. So he's got that. Yep. He's got quite a lot of affiliate deals. So he's making money through affiliate links, which I know you've got a lot of experience in, in that area too. And he's now created products. So he's got four or five um, planners. He's got other things that people can buy as well. So he's got the kind of, you know, the, the sort of branded own label thing going on that he's selling on Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I had a look the other day and he's got thousands and thousands of reviews. So I assume he's, he's probably sold thousands of products as well, but the breakdown is on his website. Oh, that's very cool. And I was going to actually mm. ask you about how people find you because you were saying about finding you, but then you said about, you know, you were posting in groups and things. So what was your marketing strategy? Because that's what I remember talking to you about before is you actually had a strategy for this. And I think that's where a lot of people fail when they start podcasting is they don't have a marketing strategy for their podcast like they would for anything else. No, no, I, I had, I had two things. I had a content strategy and, and, a, and a marketing strategy and the content, they both work together. Yeah. And the reason I say that is, um, I would do certain types of programs. One, one type, one program within my program is entrepreneur in focus. And so that's where I get people to, it doesn't really matter what sort of size or scale they are. They just tell amazing stories right mm -hmm. about their journey. And then I have masterclasses with experts that come in. So, so there's a difference there. So if someone, if, if someone's just got a great story, I tend to kind of seed that out. Uh, and I tend to put that into groups which are focused on entrepreneurship. So I've got a, a team of VAs in the Philippines who go out there and find some of the largest groups on say LinkedIn or Facebook. And they seed my content into those groups, you know, in a, in a helpful way. Cause at the end of the day, we are putting stuff out there that's helping people. So that's sort of strategy one. It's not just about advertising. It's about <clears throat> finding where your customers are or your potential clients are, and then, and then making sure they can find your message. Yeah. Second thing I did um, was as I started to get uh, more awareness and started to get some growth, I started to get a better quality of guests coming on. So as I said, John Lee Dumas is one. I've had Neil Patel, the kind of marketing expert, come on as well. Um, <clears throat> a guy called Oren Claff, who's an expert at pitching, um, raising investments. So those sort of guys. So then what I did after that is I, I got a, another person, another VA to just focus on people who have high profile. Hmm. And so all that person does is go out there and find high profile guests. And high profile means they've got a following. Obviously, they've, they've, they've done something in the world and they've written a book. They've got their own programs. And then what happens is by association and also by them sharing the fact that, you know, they've been on my podcast, it means that I get more growth that way. Mm -hmm. And then there's one other tactic which I'm playing with now and it's working really well, which is kind of what we're doing today. I'm going on more podcasts. So one of my mentors in the US is a guy called Dave Meltzer. Definitely worth a Google. He's a pretty prolific sports agent. He's a bit like, um, he's like the real life Jerry Maguire. <laughs> if people have seen that film. And um, he's, he's putting me on 15 podcasts. Uh, um, so five podcasts a month, um, 15 per quarter, um, again, in my niche. So again, I can tell what I'm doing. So all of those three things are all about putting the message. That's so a content based approach. And then I do a little bit of SEO, but the SEO is nothing compared to the rest of it. Nice. So you talked about getting high profile guests. So what, what do they want to see for them to come on your podcast? Is there any kind of, do they like seeing metrics? They want to see listener numbers. They want to see downloads. Yeah, they, do. they do, but a lot of it's the way it was described to me is, I mean, I, I've had about 150,000 downloads since I launched. So it's, mm. it's big, but it's not like, you know, the millions that some people get in the U S yeah. <clears throat> you know, and I'm UK based. So the markets are slightly different. Um, so what they look for is they, the way it was described to me is if I could get my person, so this is normally like the PR or the person managing the, the kind of high profile guest. Let's say if I can get my person um, in front of, you know, an audience of say a thousand people, 2000 people, that's a great audience if it's the right audience. Mm. Particularly if it's an hour for them to be able to talk about their theories, philosophies, what they're doing. So there is a certain, if you've got five people, that's obviously not valuable, but it doesn't have to be hundreds of thousands. Yeah. So having a reasonable amount of scale of the right quality is tick one. Um, then ge ge geography comes into play. So there isn't, there's a lot of business podcasts in the U S oh, there's a lot in the UK, but they're kind of fragmented and very specific about certain topics. 
there isn't too many sort of general ones and certainly ones like mine, which cover the mindset and the psychology of business. So it's a slightly different positioning. So I've got scale and I've got a geographic reach, which someone from the US where the majority of some of the bigger profile guests are, um, I offer a vehicle for them to grow their audience and their reach across the UK and European market. That's awesome. So, yeah, so, they're main things. so why, it's just a random question, but why did you start with the UK audience if you were, you know, starting a podcast? Could you have, could um, it just, just, just easily have here. targeted? <laughs> Because I live here, you know, I, I had a mentor, a guy called Rob Moore, um, who's got a podcast called Disruptive Entrepreneur in the UK. And he he kind of inspired me to put one out there and do one. Um, and because I hadn't even thought about it, I just kind of, it just kind of happened over the course of a couple of days. I was listening to one of his, he does his master classes and I went to one of them. And he just talked about, you know, launching a podcast in the UK. So that's what I did. In hindsight, um, I mean, it was a good thing to do, but now all of my focus is mainly North America um, mm. or, or rest of world as well to some extent. But North America is big because um, podcasts, there's more traction there and obviously the audience reaches bigger. But there's more competition. So to get higher up the rankings on, say, Apple, um, mm. Spotify and all that sort of thing, it's harder to break into the um, US market. A bit like being a, a boy band. <laughs> oh, I imagine you in a boy band, actually. That's a long um, time ago. That would be funny. <laughs> Um, cool. So when you're, when you're trying to break the U S as well as doing guest posting, are you doing aggressive outreach to potential listeners? Cause this is something that we talked about before. Yeah, not, not, I wouldn't call it aggressive. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm posting all the time and putting content around my personal brand all the time. So the podcast is the main vehicle for that. But if you mm. look at, if anyone follows me on LinkedIn or, um, or Facebook, you know, I've got a whole, I, I launched the scale up your business community page on, um, on Facebook recently. That's got climbing up to a thousand um, people in that now. Yeah. I've got something like 1500 in my personal page on Facebook. So what I have done is I've focused on, um, personal branding. You know, you could, you could call that aggressive or assertive yeah. personal branding. And the way that people first come into my ecosystem is through the podcast. So what might be useful, um, I think for your listeners, let me explain how I think of that. So I, I've generated, it's probably, it's probably came out to about half a million now, just off my personal brand since launch, you know, and that's what we call trickle down revenue. So I'll explain how that is. It's not just the podcast, but the personal brand and having, uh, having more of a position and having more notoriety has allowed other things to come in. Yeah. And as we said before, I monetize by education products. I have coaching, mentoring. My biggest um, commercial client um, pays me just short of a hundred grand a year just to consult with them. Now, all of that has come in from the podcast. So the way I look at it is I've got like a funnel. So people, people understand marketing funnels. Yeah. My top of funnel, my free, if you like, is the podcast. So I funnel everyone into the podcast. And then from the podcast, they can join my community. And then I'm building lists, et cetera. Yeah. And then from that, I have a number of different products that I have in place or is launch, or about to launch, which allows people to buy in at different um, pricing levels into my world. And that's how I do it. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, sorry. No, the, in terms of aggressive, I just meant outbound. Because um, I remember we were talking before, I can't remember if you said it or if I said it, but I thought like a great way to, to gain listeners would be to outbound market to different platforms, for, for example, LinkedIn. Uh, using different strategies because they're so you can still target people so easily and actually connect with them so easily and by sending you know useful different episodes to people who would be interested in it to me seemed like a great way, <clears throat> a great way of building listenership by directly yeah. marketing one listener at a time but it's always one conversation it. at a time it's yeah. always one conversation at a time but it's but it's funny I do that. Um, I do that to this day. I still do that. In fact, I was just, just before coming on here, I was finalizing a script that I have my VA send mm -hmm. out one to one to um, CEOs and founders on LinkedIn. Yeah. But it's funny. It's, it's always a process of tweaking and tuning. Yeah, so I, I tried something last week where I put a little bit more in um, detail in, and then I got quite a lot of negative feedback over the mm -hmm. weekend because it was too long. Um, I tried something on Facebook the other day, which was similar where I was using testing some advertising as well. And I had, what was one of the quotes that came back? I hope you, um, I hope you drink the devil's urine and die. What were you, what were you trying to sell? Um, <laughs> what, were, what, was, what, was, uh, what was your messaging? 
No, it was it was a business growth accelerator program. But again, when you when you sometimes use Facebook ads, it's still even though it's got one of the best advertising algorithms um, around, certainly to the level of detail, you end up in someone's feed. And some people yeah. still don't realize how commercial Facebook has become. They still think it's like their personal thing. So if you come up as an ad in someone's feed and it's not the right mix, then of course they can get quite aggressive. I've had, I mean, that, that's a, that's a sanitized version, John. I could have given you some of the other I know, ones. I, I can, I can, I can imagine. Um, but you know, what is interesting and this is probably worth your listeners understanding is the more you put yourself out there, be that in a podcast, be that through social media, personal branding, you're going to have people who absolutely love you raving fans. Right. And you're going to have people who just hate you and want you dead. Okay. And that's the reality of it. And yeah. someone said to me once, if you don't have haters, uh, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> you're too, yeah. you're too kind of safe down the middle. You've got to be a little bit, you've got to stand for something and you've got to stand against something. You've got to have an opinion. So. No, I believe that as well. <laughs> Thanks yeah. for sharing. That's all right. I know it's a bit of a full on comment. I didn't, I didn't go and cry in the corner. I just thought well, that's entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> and I've, I've heard about that. I've heard about people who do ads for other companies as well. Also getting stuff like that at the moment, like asking people, how dare you advertise at times like this? And it's like, well, yeah. if you don't want to die as a business, you should be advertising more at times. Well, like I'm, this. I'm cautious about it because um, my, my whole thing at the moment is about audience amplification, right? Mm. Building reach, building engagement. It's not really about selling. And as much as I was putting people out, I mean, I never really hard sell. It's an invitation. It's either right for you if it's not, or it's not. I'm not going to yeah. force someone to do something. And I don't want anyone on any of my programs that are going to be hard work anyway, right? Um, but that said, you know, the psychology right now I'm saying to people is serve. So serve people, educate, inspire, inform. Um, and then, you know, you can earn the right to invite people to participate in something which they can pay for. But, you know, it's their choice. So some people kind of, take that to the extreme obviously and just get annoyed because it doesn't fit with their their philosophy or understanding of what's going on i know yeah and that's good because they're not your ideal customer anyway they're never going to buy anything uh, from you it's also limited because if you think about it um the only way the economy globally is going to start to you know um drive again is 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 by some people having success it may not be everybody but you know if the if everything stops and money stops flowing around um, different people, different organizations, that's not good for anybody. But a lot of people don't understand the, the economy, uh, the economics, sorry, of that. Yeah, for sure. And like we see, yeah, we're still making sales every week. So things are definitely moving. And actually yeah. people are doubling down because some people are really doing well right now. Because yeah, like some, exactly. you know, some industries are down, some industries are up, but people are making a lot of money. So it's super interesting talking to them. So what started you on your journey? How did you end up in entrepreneurship? Ooh. You know a little bit of this, but I'll show you one. So I, um, I had a corporate career, sort of uh, close to 15 years, 20 years, um, big sort of companies, um, media companies like News International, um, Getty Images, quite a lot, some large magazine um, publishers also in the UK and, and Australia where mm -hmm. I grew up. Um, and then I went into private equity um, just after that. And I kind of, I, the, the honest answer is I kept getting sacked. I kept getting fired. And <laughs> I didn't know that one. <laughs> well, what it was is I didn't, I didn't, I think lots of entrepreneurs are unemployable or you, mm. you become unemployable after a while because you don't like, there's a lot of politics that happen in large corporates and um, particularly because I was the CEO of a lot of these businesses. All right. So particularly in the private equity world, these are mid markets. So it means they're anywhere sort of five, um, sorry, uh, seven to eight figure businesses. So, you know, you, usually in the eight figures, they might be turning over 25, 30 million. So I was the CEO of that sort of size business. And, um, and of course, when you're the CEO, everyone thinks you're the boss, but you're not, right? There's always um, a board or investors. And a lot of the times at that level of an organization, there are decisions made, which are, they can grate with your ethics. They can grate with your values. Like someone might say, oh, we're going to sack all the staff just because I need to make my bonus or make my mm. dividend. And you kind of got to make a choice then. Do you want to be part of that or not? So a lot of the time I would be like, well, I'm not going to do that. So we have a problem, don't we? And then <laughs> out you go. <laughs> so I thought instead of, instead of keeping, to do, keep, keeping doing that and relying on a salary, you know, I was offering a lot of value. I knew what to do with these businesses. Why don't I go and do it for myself? And I think to be honest about it, I probably I should have done that sooner because I was probably in that um emotionally in that space anyway 
I just hadn't made the decision. And then I made the decision after going, getting involved in some Tony Robbins stuff. And you know the story behind that. I went to a Unleash the Power Within event in Chicago, kind of realized that if I keep staying employed, it's not going to allow me to get where I want to in life. So I decided to, what's the, what's the expression? Burn the boat. <laughs> <laughs> quit, quit all forms of um, stability of employment and then go out there and become self-employed. And that's now three and a half years, something like that. And still the best decision I could have made and definitely much, much better than having to answer to someone. Yeah, that sounds awesome. So I think like one of the things that I believe is that, you know, working for yourself and being successful and making a difference is all about belief and like believing that we can do it and believing that we, you know, us personally can do it. Because I always, you know, find that like whenever anyone's successful, like the second time they start a business or the third business they start, it grows a 10 times faster because they know something they knew, they knew before, but they also believe something that they yeah. didn't believe before, whether it's on average sale or the number of customers they can acquire at once or the scale they can get to super quickly. So when did you start believing that you could actually do this? Um, the, what I often say to people is everything's hard the first time, hmm. right? Because you know, you're, you're having to work everything out. So you're going to have, you're going to have failures if you want to call it that, um, or you're going to have things not work out how you'd want them to, but it's only really failure if you give up. And a lot of people try it. It doesn't work how they expect it to, and then they stop. Um, the belief piece of the question I think is, I mean, I always had reasonably strong conviction and self-belief, but um, I, you know, I work on that every day now. So there's a piece there where you, know, you can actually program your brain around these things as, as you and I both know. And so um, my sort of belief now is, and, and proven belief, is you know, to be successful around these sort of things, you've got to work on that part of your psychology and your mindset. And if you do that, if you, if you have that as something which is a, a habit, a daily habit, weekly habit, then, um, then you, you start to become more certain. So, so if I go back before I was an entrepreneur, I had self-belief, but I, I probably had more uncertainty and more doubt. When I started doing more personal development, I massively increased my, my belief in myself and certainty because I yeah. knew a system you know, to do it. And, and that was the difference for me. And so therefore the stuff I've done since then, even though I've had, you know, failures cause I'm doing new things, failures in terms of they haven't worked out. I haven't stopped. I've kept on going on that path. Cool. So yeah, that's pretty interesting what you said about, yeah, programming yourself every day. So what, can you take us through a little bit of, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah. What time is it here? It's, it's 10 30 in the morning. <laughs> on a Monday in the UK. Anyway, I know you're in another part of the world. So yeah, that's this morning, what I did this morning. So I, I, always, I always get up in the morning and I get outside as quickly as I can. So that's usually either to do some exercise or even just go for a walk. Um, and there's, a, there's a, a theory behind that around, you know, you start to change your physiology, you, know, you start to wake yourself up, you know, oxygen to your brain, breathing, all that sort of stuff. It just starts to get you aware and, and intentional and focused and present. So, so one thing I always start the day with something like that. I always start the day with some sort of breathing or um, silence. I wouldn't necessarily call it meditation. I do some meditation later in the day. I don't get up and meditate as some people do, but I get up and I, I move. And I normally do a, a, a short practice of gratitude. Um, and the reason behind that, just the psychology for everyone listening is, if you're grateful for what you have in life, right? Fear and any of that stuff um, tends to dissipate because, you know, you actually really appreciate what you have. And that's an important part because you're not chasing something. You're, you're sort of more grounded in the present. So I do that. Um, and then I do, uh, I always um, sort of visualize a number of goals that I'm working towards. And that's normally, normally up to five things that are kind of in my frame at any one time. Mm. And I visualize, um, having achieved that goal as opposed to it not being there. So a coach of mine once said a goal is something that you come from, not something you work towards. It's quite interesting. We have to say that a few times for people to get it, but you know, you you have to attain it first in your brain. You have to visualize that you're there and then it becomes a direction point. You become pulled towards it. Mm. So I do that. Um, and then I do some affirmations. So affirmations for everybody um, is usually kind of statements. I am statements. And they are again um, created in to some extent the future tense. So what I am becoming. So if I am, you know, some of those like I am a courageous entrepreneur, I am a relentless deal maker. A lot of them are around the things that I focus my time on. 
and they're programming my brain to, again, back to your question on belief, you know, believe that I have the attributes. But, but the secret of this is you've got to first create the stuff in your brain before you can physically um, or realistically attain it. And that's the thing that most people don't get. They kind of think if they just work around stuff, they're going to get what they want. But more often than not, they're going to end up somewhere they don't want to be because they haven't put that work in um, up front to build the foundations. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that's a big thing in psychology, isn't it? That your body can't tell the difference between you having achieved something and you thinking about having achieved something. So, you know, if you want to know what you'll feel like once you've achieved the goal, just imagine you've achieved the goal and try and believe you've achieved the goal and you're going to feel exactly like that. And your body's not going to know the difference. (laughs) No, you've got to make it an emotional thing. And this is where, again, my podcast is probably a little bit out there for some people because they don't expect it to be this. Mm. Um, But I always say, I mean, it's funny, like I've got a five-day challenge running at the moment. um, And the first day, the day one exercise of the five-day challenge is vision. Yeah. And so um, what I've tasked everyone to do, literally started today, I've tasked everyone today to go away and spend, um, you know, to just do a really, really short, sharp three-year vision, but written, written as a letter back to yourself, having achieved whatever you want to achieve in three years. So that's, you know, hi, John, you know, thanks for, you know, for putting in the work, commitment, blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah. and then there's different areas. So there's relationships, there's business, there's health, et cetera, et cetera. But if you've got that all written down and you look at it kind of continuously, then you've got your North Star you've got the thing you're working towards and then the rest of it just becomes, I wouldn't say easy, but it becomes more visible to you. Sure. Yeah. I have to, I believe the same thing. Like most people, the reason most people do not have, you know, as much success as they want is they like clarity. Like clarity is the number one thing. And most people don't have a clue where they're going, even if they're doing well. Um, so yeah, that's, that was, that was the biggest also, thing for me. And certainty as well. I mean, you know, we talked about certainty and we talked about certainty and uncertainty together before this is funny, this whole kind of, you know, as people go through COVID-19 and all that, you've got, you know, people think they have certainty in their life, mm. right? They always think, and they think like having a job is certainty, it's stability. But the reality of it, none of it really is, you know, it's not really there. It's kind of like, it's only there because you've created a picture in your brain, you think it's safe. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when something big happens, like what's happening right now, is people realize actually they haven't got this, that, that stability and that certainty. Yeah. So... Yeah. So as soon as you embrace that and understand it, it actually frees you because it doesn't mean that that's a bad thing. It just means you've got to act differently, be more resourceful, as we've said. Mm. Um, but most people, most people don't think like that in the world. Yeah, for sure. And, but I think, you know, clarity gives you certainty and then everything is like a self-fulfilling prophecy after that, like clarity, certainty, and belief kind of go round. And like, once you see something that, you know, reinforces it, it just gets better and better and better. And Cause, yeah. cause your story, I mean, you're, with your story, so because you, you know, you obviously, you know, you've moved overseas from the UK, then you must have started in a similar way. You must have thought, actually, I want to, I want to be, as you say, location independent. Um, I want to kind of have this, that and the other. So you would have created that as a thought first before you executed. Yeah, completely. I mean, at the time, but at the time, I didn't have that much belief about what I was going to do until I saw one thing. And I was like, wow, I can see how this works. And I believe I can actually make this successful. So I saw, you know, the original business I started after I tried many different things um, was FBA, like Amazon, selling stuff on Amazon. Yeah. And it was the first time I saw something where I thought, wow, well, I, I know I can see exactly how I get from, you know, from stage to stage. I can see people, you know, just like me or not as smart as me doing the same thing and being very successful. And uh, yeah, that's, that's why that's when I started to believe this is possible. And then, you know, my latest business, the same thing. I saw the system and I was like, wow, I can see how this system can scale. Uh, and I believed it's possible. Um, and I kind of think this is the reason I started the podcast is because seeing other people's stories who are just ahead of you or further ahead of you, but you hear what they did, how they did it and how they were successful at it kind of makes you, be- well, makes people that listen or makes me even believe this is possible and that I can do the same thing. Like I've got so many friends, you know, location independent, live anywhere in the world, you know, do hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in revenue. And they're just like, they started out just like anyone else. And that's why I wanted to start this podcast because I believe there's lots of value that can be given there. Like we, we're going to have, we have mini series and we also have these interviews with different people who've made one of these models that we talk about successful. And then let's break it down. Good. Well, that, but that, yeah, as we also know from kind of the stuff we've done that, <laughs> you know, achievements um, and fulfillment kind of are, 
equally important, right? Mm. So the film aside, again, one of the reasons I did the podcast when I continue to do it is um, because it allows me to kind of contribute, to give something back to people of X number of years I've had growing and scaling businesses. So there's two parts there. Yeah, it does help support and grow my businesses in different ways. Um, but if it was just about that, I think it would be, it wouldn't be as addictive, you know, as it is, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, continually relentlessly do it. It would feel more like a chore because I know it helps people and people contact me all the time wanting advice. It kind of gives me a sense of satisfaction that I'm helping as well as, as growing my businesses. So that's, that's the other thing around, <clears throat> around putting yourself out there that some people don't get. Oh, completely. Yeah. And they say, what's it? If anything, it's the Tony Robbins thing and the six human needs, but if anything fulfills three needs, it becomes an addiction. It sounds like for you, it fulfills what connection, contribution, probably some significance, some yeah. certainty, like you've got at least four things there. Like you're going to be well, like, it. definitely, I've thought about this life. before. Yeah, definitely the first three, you know, um, yeah. for sure. Um, and you're right. That's hundred percent right. And then it becomes something that you, I don't even think about doing it. There's some weeks are more challenging than others. Um, just cause I've got lots on, but I, I, I batch record all my podcasts quite a bit as well. So I've now got better at doing certain podcast recording days and then I might get a month's worth of podcasts done in a day and then I can you know, work out when I'm going to sort of send them out. Um, so then it just becomes a machine. You just turn it into a process. That's perfect. Yeah. And that's exactly what we're trying to do as well. Building out the system and then just getting somebody else to do all the hard work. So I can do the fun that's bit. Right. Well, that's, the whole, that's, that's the fun. Exactly. Well, I've got, I've, I've got now something like five people on my podcast, a team plus mm. an agency that does all my post-production. Um, so the whole thing, all I need to do really is, uh, when I'm doing my own ones, create the content of the episodes when it's just me speaking, um, or conversely choose, um, people who are pushing themselves to be guests on the show, which happens quite a lot now. So there's a bit of that, but that's about it really. No, that's very cool. And that's where I want to be in the next couple of months. <laughs> Good. That doesn't um, take too long. No. Yeah. It's kind of, yeah. <laughs> quite that long. Just need to get it all sorted. Um, Okay. So I thought it was a good question for you because you know, you see so many businesses, you talk to so many different people and different businesses. So my question to you is what, biz what other businesses have you seen or heard about recently, whether it's a business or a business model, do you think super interesting and super cool? Uh, you know, something you would do or just that you think is really interesting. Yeah. Probably a couple of things I'll talk about. So, um, just for everyone's perspectives, again listening i don't i don't tend to invest in sort of tech startups which some people kind of get surprised by this right um and the reason i don't is i think the world's gone a little bit mad about crazy valuations of businesses that are not really you know they might have some audience but they're not really profitable and you you know a lot of people will shoot me down for that because yeah but you know obviously facebook when they ipo didn't have any you know they weren't profitable blah 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 yeah i get that but the problem is what a lot of people have done is they've followed these kind of big names and they've thought that they can do the same thing. And there's a, a term in the tech world called unicorns, which is, you know, you might know a billion dollar valuation. And I, I just, I don't play in that space. I, I went to um, New York about 18 months ago and I sat in a room uh, looking at some HR software businesses, right? And there was 10 people presenting. And there was a point halfway through the day where I couldn't draw a line between these different platforms from a features perspective the only difference was funny was the i think the company that pitched first or second um the third the the, the founder was the third employee of facebook mm. and that's the only difference i could draw a line and they all you know say these things are going to be worth millions and billions and whatever yeah, yeah so so i don't play there so where i do play and this is kind of where where i think there is a an opportunity is there's a huge um what do you want to call it epidemic um of sort of baby boomer retirement you know, basically all the baby boomers from sort of the back in the, in the kind of 50s, if you like, and now retirement age, um, 50s and 60s. And so you've got lots of businesses that are now for sale from these people, people in their 60s and 70s that are hugely profitable, valuable businesses. And there aren't enough um, buyers in the market versus sellers. So you can pick up a profitable business in some cases for no money down. Um, that's not easy, by the way. You know, you've got to look for that type of business, but it is possible to buy a business and use the profits of the business to pay the seller back over time. So for me, that's an opportunity right now, whether, whether it's a business model or just a point in time. But if you have aspirations of wealth creation and you're thinking, you know what, I don't want to go through the pain of a startup, right? You don't have to, you could actually buy an established business. And if you understand, you know, the principles of modern marketing, 
operations leverage you can probably go into a business like that and make it even more profitable and all of a sudden you've circumvented a lot of that early stage risk so so that's one area just to kind of sow the seed for people because a lot of people don't realize that that's an opportunity for them so that's there um in terms of in terms of business models and this probably i think relates quite nicely to your show is as much as I think, you know, once, once all the COVID-19 thing, um, you know, transitions back to some form of normal, whatever that is, I don't think things will go back to what they were. So the idea of remote working, the idea of, of kind of, you know, being able to do anything from anywhere, even for the larger corporates, um, is going to be a massive thing. So I think understanding um, the businesses that can support that, not just the Zooms, or there's a new Facebook um, mechanism coming you know, live soon as well, I've seen, if it's not all live already, not just the, the, the software of connection or the businesses of connection, but what else, what other opportunities does that present for people who can live anywhere, work anywhere, be more home, um, uh, you know, they'd be spending more time at home, for example, um, more time with their families. So I think there's, if I was playing around the edges of stuff, I'd start to think about what that could be and start to think of the, are there any businesses around that space that could be interesting? Because I think also as part of that, just to finish the point, and, and I've kind of been working in this world um, for years anyway, but you know, there's, there isn't really any geographic constraints anymore. You know, um, I, I was running teams in, in America back in 2009 without even having met them. And that was very early stage of what we're seeing now. Yeah. So if you jump ahead five years, what's that going to be like? So if I was starting a business now from a startup, I'd be thinking about what's, how can I play in that space and how can I make that better? So it could be everything from if I'm in a, let's say I'm working in HR or employee benefits, you know, and I want to create a tool in that space. How can I do that for people who don't even turn up to a workplace anymore? You know, how does that change the way a business needs to run and operate? How can I consult around that? So there's lots of opportunities if you open your mind up to, to kind of how that world is going to evolve. That's awesome. Yeah, and I, I agree completely on that. And it's been happening. People have been saying things, similar things in some of the mastermind groups I'm a part of, of like the kind of glut of entrepreneurship that's probably going to come out the other side of this as well. Like people wanting to start their own businesses or contracting for themselves or working from home. And there's gonna be a massive industry pop up to serve these people. Like anybody that's like serving people who want to start their businesses, people serving people who want to scale um, and yeah, run and run remote teams, do things for remote teams, all that type of stuff. And yeah, super interesting. Yeah, and, and another point I suppose you just <laughs> reminded me of, as you were saying is that as I've had a number of friends um, lose their corporate jobs in the last mm -hmm. few weeks. And actually, it's not just the last few weeks. I think back a couple of them in banking and financial services. Um, they've lost their jobs continuously after the last few years because no one knows what the world's changing. So one thing I do say to people is I don't think you can. And this is another polarizing statement, but I'll say it. You can't afford not to have a profile or a personal brand these days. It doesn't have to be like what I'm doing or what you're doing. Right. But you, you can't not just be be faceless. Because, you know, I, as I say, if everything's ripped apart and taken away from you, what are you going to do to survive? You know, you've got to be able to have a way of generating your own income somehow. And that could be through investments, you know, buying houses and, and playing that thing. Or it could be by being consultant. It could be doing podcasting. It could be whatever. But you've got to have something. Um, and that's the thing that I think people, if they could do one thing, take one thing away from this, is work out what that is. Because even if you are going to get another job with someone, which is fine, having a better profile, having a profile which has, you know, um, something about it, you know, some sort of understanding of what you are and what you stand for is going to help you if you're just another CV, you know, turning up on someone's desk. Completely. And I, I do agree having a personal brand to be very helpful. And obviously that's the reason, one of the reasons I started the podcast was to, you know, talk to people and get my name out of there. But I kind of feel like the other thing, like being able, like other massive skill that people need to learn is how to sell themselves and sell themselves as a service, how to package an offer, how to figure out how much something's really worth. Because when you've been an employee, you assume something's worth a certain amount because somebody was paying you that amount. But in reality, what you delivered was worth probably, you know, four to eight times, whatever that was. So if you want to do a one-off job for somebody, you need to know how to price something, how to sell it and how to package it in a way that, you know, you can take away 50% of your previous yearly income just in that project. Whereas you don't want to be like, cause too many people I think start, you know, contracting, consulting for themselves and charge out based on what they were being paid before. And then you're scraping, you know, scrambling month to month trying to get things done. 
Whereas in reality, they could be pitching it, what, six, you know, six months previous salary because the result yeah. is worth this much to the company. And, you know, part of that process is figuring out how much what you do is, you know, how much what you do is worth to somebody so that you yeah, can price yourself point. properly. It's a hard one because um, one of my coaches said at the moment, he uses the, state, the statement when this comes up, which is um, MSU, which, which, which the, the polite way of saying that is make stuff up, but there's another way of make S up. Because um, <laughs> I said to him, he, he, his coaching practice is um, just under $3 million. Hmm. That's what he charges, right? And he's got a couple, a couple of coaching people. I know Sorry, he there. charges $3 million or his total of all his students is $3 million? He, wor- he works with 15 clients a year and makes $3 million. Sounds good to me, but he's not coaching oh, you then, of, or are you paying him? I'm are you paying, paying him. For <laughs> half a million? 15 clients, there, $3 yeah. million, dollars, that's uh, 200 grand. Are you paying him 200 grand I'm a year? I'm, I'm part of a group coaching program, uh, which is, it's got about 25 of us in it, um, each paying 15 grand. So work the numbers out on that. So he's getting yeah. three, 400 grand. So he said that. he's got 15 clients making $3 million, but we already know he's got 25 clients in your group. He's got more going on, but... Um, he's that's he's making more than that that's just mm. in some areas but one of the guys i'm buddied up with um is, is making a million off just 10 clients so 100 wow. grand each and what's he do at, uh he goes into um tech startups in um san francisco he's ex google yeah. and he basically goes in there and, and turns them in. he basically coaches the leadership teams to be leaders nice a lot of them are kind of you know clever clever coders particularly in that world and they've got no idea what it means to suddenly you know step outside of the computer and do something so he does that very but he gets cool. paid by the investors, the big VCs. Hmm. So that's a, an example. But to your point, you know, people ask, you know, what do you charge? And in the beginning, I didn't know how to answer that question. I was like, well, I don't know. And, and you, I suppose your starting point is, well, what was, what was I earning? So therefore, what's a decent day rate? Hmm. But um, one of the things um, Rich, Rich Lipton said to me, he said, just triple your prices. He said, straight away. So whatever you think your price is, triple it. Yeah. Oh, but people are going to say no, are they? Do you know that? Mm. so it's interesting that i only started doing this and a couple of i've had i've had some no's probably more no's yeah. than yeses but i've actually had a couple of yeses and you kind of go something in this because you know i don't need as many clients and therefore it's less stressful mm. and if i can keep optimizing that model and understand exactly as your point what's the value as opposed to what i need um then that's a different way of thinking mm. and i also think i know this is a we're not with this going slightly off topic, but some of the questions that I really like on those type of things, because we've been doing lots of sales recently and sales is the new thing that we're concentrating on. Like the best, my favorite question is, you know, how much is that worth? You know, so we've already worked out what your goals are, what you want to get to. If you get to those goals, how much would this be worth to you? Like most, if you've done a good, well, if we've done a good job, most of the time it's infinite, um, you know, because the upside is, you know, if it's a sales system or if it's working with you to make their life better, the upside is infinite. Well, I mean, I'm not going to charge you infinite, am I? But, the, you know, we work together on this type of plan and this is, you know, this is how much it costs. Yeah. Um, and they've already set the number as something super high. Yeah, well, that's the psychology piece. But I always yeah. often say is it's an invitation. And the other thing I do, and I do this genuinely because I think it's important, is I don't want to work with, I don't want to work with, with people who um, there's a, there's a, a mismatch between values and whatever mm. else. So I'll often say to people, even if we do agree a number, I'll often say, I want you to go away now for 72 hours and think about it. And it has to be a hell yes. Mm, Cause if, if you come back and you, and it's not a hell yes, so there's two parts. There. Some people think that's crazy because it's like, I'll go for the clothes, go for the clothes. And I go, no, no, no. Think about it. If someone doesn't want to do it, particularly in what I do, which is kind of, you know, a lot of one-to-one stuff, they're not going to show up. They're not going to do the work. They're not going to get the result of, as a, as a thing of that. They're going to probably blame me or blame the situation. It's going to be a really crappy situation. So I want someone to go and say, you know what, this is a must do in my head. I have to work with you. Yeah. And then it's a, it's a shift in the way that the whole relationship works. I agree. That sounds very good. Uh, but it's all about psychology and phrasing that right and making sure you're giving them every chance of saying yes, because you don't want to push yeah. them too far in the wrong direction either. No, but, but there, is a, there is a thing here where if someone doesn't come back, then they weren't right. And then if you, and you've got to have an abundance mindset here, which is there are enough people out there who will say yes. Oh, for but sure, but it's also our in. responsibility to make sure that if it's good for them, that we do our best to sell them on it because they're going to get the most, most results from working with you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yes and no. But again, I, as I said, I like people. If, if someone's not ready, they're not ready. You mm. know, and I've, and I've been involved in ecosystems before where there's a lot of pressure 
to push someone in and they might do it. You're right. There are a few people who go through and they go, Oh yeah, I was going to say no, but I went through it. It was fantastic for me. But as I said, I prefer people to, um, to make, I, I prefer them to fully make the commitment. Yeah. Cause I've had good. just, just my model, just my model because I enjoy it. They enjoy it. Mm. And, and I tend to get the better results from that as well. Cool. Sounds good. All right. So just a couple more things ready. So what else excites you at the moment? What are you excited about? Uh, I'm excited. I'm actually quite excited about the whole landscape and change. I think, I think the thing with, with where we are right now with kind of mass lockdowns and quarantines is that uh, it's, it's such a global thing, right? It's not like it's one country or one industry sector that's struggling. It's like everything. And so I kind of, I, I have a belief that, you know, innovation comes from these type of points. So I'm doing more stuff now that I probably should have been doing previously. Like, like stuff that was in my head to happen, mm. you know, in a year's time I've brought forward and I'm doing it now. So I quite like that. Um, and I also see, as I said, the opportunities around the areas that I'm in as much as some people right now are struggling to afford maybe some of my services or in the head, they certainly are. They're thinking I need to, they're, they're in that kind of mindset of safety and I need to hunker down. Um, there will definitely be a slingshot or a snapback at some point where people will become restless that their business isn't where it was like, Oh, you know, once the certainty comes back to some extent. So I'm thinking, okay, what can I do right now to be remembered and to show up and all that sort of stuff in a point where when they are ready, then they'll remember the stuff that I did at the point when they may not have been ready. Hmm. You see what I mean? So it's a lot of marketing. It's a lot of, it's more doubling down on that stuff than what I was. So yes, that's what excites me. And I, and I'm, and I'm a positive guy about this stuff. I think, you know, things will transition. I'm looking forward to getting on a plane again and going and having a holiday, <laughs> yeah, <me too. laughs> sitting, sitting on a beach somewhere. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> no, I think we're going to go next week, actually get out of Saigon and up to the coast so that we can also sit staring at the beach for a couple of months rather than staring see, at see, other that's buildings. Lovely. No, I've got kids in homeschooling. <laughs> oh, like homeschool anywhere in the world, can't you? Well, yeah, that's true, but no, not, not, not easily at the moment, but it, listen, it will transition at some point soon. Yeah. And I also believe it's going to, I mean, things aren't as bad as people are making out. I mean, in some, in some industries it's bad, but in other industries, things that go down very quickly will also come up very quickly because, you know, the whole world is completely different from how it was two months ago. But, you know, for example, here in, here in Saigon, where I'm at the moment, uh, they stopped lockdown what, three days ago and you couldn't tell that was lockdown. Like, I mean, it's over, pollution's back, people are out drinking coffee, drinking beer, like, it's the same. So we haven't got that yet, and I think we're still a fair way off that. Yeah, you're probably two months, a month and a half, two months off that, possibly. Possibly, yeah. So we're technically not supposed to travel at all, Mm. Um, you know, 30 minutes of exercise a day. And in fairness, everyone seems to, where I live, which is not in one of the, I'm not in the built-up areas of the UK, I'm outside of London, it's it's, people are adhering to that. So, Mm. So that's good. Yeah, I agree. Last question for you then, Nick. How Perfect. can people find you? Ah, you want them easy. to find you. <laughs> if they want to find me, as I said. Um, so podcast is Scale Your Business with Nick Bradley. So you can do a Google on that. You can find me on, on all the major platforms. Most people go to Spotify and, and iTunes and that sort of thing, or Apple Podcasts, as it's now called. Mm-hmm. Uh, my personal website is nickcbradley.com. So that's nickcbradley.com. And I've also got um, the Scale Up Your Business Academy um, and the community. So the best place to find that is to go onto Facebook and you can join the scale up your business community. Obviously it's a free closed group and it's entrepreneurs, business leaders, everyone who's, who's wanting to kind of get help and assistance and collaborate on business growth and scale up. So if anyone's in that place and they want to kind of reach out and I often say to people as well, if they want to have a conversation about their business with me, I'm always happy to jump on a quick call with people as well. So they can get me in any of those, any of those platforms and, uh, and send me a message. Perfect. Thanks, Nick. That's great. No, you have I been an that. awesome Thanks guest. Very much. Thanks for coming. And, uh, I, <laughs> I hope I've helped some soon. people. <laughs> All course. right. Excellent. Thanks, John. Thanks, Nick. See ya.